Uh, Mr. Prosecutor, it's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Have you identified any command responsibility focuses? In other words, is Putin a subject of interest in, in, in any of the war crimes that you have seen so far? And how is the United States, even though they're not signatories of the Rome Statute, how are they contributing? They said they are sending information. Are they doing that to, the, uh, to your office? Thank you. Yes. No, it's an interesting question and, and, and a good question, but we follow the evidence. We don't, uh, uh, we're not so self-indulgent or inappropriate to decide with the targets and then try to get evidence, scratch and grub around for evidence that fits pre-identified targets. That action would not be becoming of a, a local prosecutor in a local magistrate's court, and it's certainly not appropriate at the international level. We follow the evidence, uh, and we are, uh, nobody has uh, a free pass on any side, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's the Russian Federation, whether it's uh, formal forces or whether it's uh, irregular uh, forces. Uh, the law is clear. There are clear parameters. Nobody can say in 2022 with the internet, with, uh, with Twitter, with um, movies, with, uh, that nobody knows what these laws are. Everybody knows what these laws are. The question is, do people think that international criminal law is an a la carte menu, that you can take what you want and ignore what you don't? And I think uh, collectively all states uh, are not perfect. None of us are. There's been a degree of duality. There's a, been a degree of selectivity. But I think now we're at a very acute moment in which we need to realize whatever the momentary discomfort of complying with the law at a state level, uh, it is far better and it is far less painful than the alternative, which is uh, a wild west of unpredictability that could lead to even more catastrophe on a global scale. The US, James Bayes. Uh, on the U.S., I've said since before my election, I will reach out and engage with state parties and with non-state parties. You've seen today the excellent Ambassador at Large uh, uh, for uh, Global Criminal Justice. Ambassador Beth Van Schack has made her remarks, and I think they speak much more eloquently than I could possibly try to replicate. James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Um, you said in the meeting that you've made three attempts to try and contact Russia. You also heard from the Russian representative in that meeting who said the ICC is merely a political instrument and has nothing in common with justice. Having heard, heard those words, what are your reaction to that and what will it mean for your investigation if you get no cooperation from Russia? You know, it's not uh, unknown in uh, local uh, prosecutions uh, that um, there may be non-cooperation from different individuals that one wishes to speak to. Uh, that doesn't mean that one retires uh, or that one uh, goes to bed and pulls the covers over one's face. It means that they, one looks at other approaches. Uh, I, I've said very clearly I don't have an agenda. Uh, I'm not in favor of Russia or against Russia, nor am I in favor of uh, Ukraine or against Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, an issue of politics. What we are in favor of, and it wasn't a soundbite, is that we are in favor of the law, which is in favor of humanity, which is to protect humanity. Um, and so we will do our job. Uh, there's always different ways to try to get to the truth. And as long as we have the stamina, uh, the strategic focus, and the uh, plan in place, uh, there are always different uh, options to try to get to the truth. And we've seen it. It's not a hot air. You've, you've heard already today examples that you all know very well, whether it's uh, Sierra Leone and Charles Taylor or whether it's uh, you know, uh, ICTY cases from low level to the highest level. The basic principle is not new. It's based upon even uh, in antiquity, but in more recent times, or at least in 1215, the Magna Carta uh, and the uh, well-known adage that the, the king is under no man but God and the law. This applies with equal force today, that the law is above us. And if the law is not below, uh, above us, there's nothing below us uh, except the abyss. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. We've heard um, a lot of growing concerns here about sexual violence in Ukraine, um, even an accusation that rape may be, used, may be being used as a weapon of war. Uh, what evidence has your office found so far of sexual violence in Ukraine? I, I'm not going to discuss the nature of evidence because we uh, hear reports, we'll take evidence and every piece of evidence has to be evaluated. But I said uh, very early on, I think in my first uh, interview, in fact, um, and based upon experience, that uh, whilst we were focusing at that stage, uh, or even the newspaper reports and the TV reports were focusing uh, on shelling, on, on targeting, um, it was not surprising that um, 
as urban warfare intensified, uh, I said I feared that there would be increasing uh, allegations and reports of sexual gender-based uh, violence and also increasing reports regarding how cr children may be targeted or certainly affected uh, by, by conflict. And we need to um, you know, continue our discipline and, and our focus. So the way we approach evidence and the detachment and the objectivity with which we collect it and consider it can be uh, capable of being you know, assessed and, if necessary, uh, presented to judges without it being uh, polluted with any consideration that we've jumped the gun and we haven't followed normal processes. But it's a very important area. It's an, uh, an area that I have said repeatedly from before the 24th of February, I will prioritize uh, sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children are uh, traditionally underreported, uh, under-investigated, uh, and under, under-charged, and particularly, uh, even more so, I think, than anything else, children very often are invisible and we need to bring them into the, into the light in terms of how they are affected by, uh, by conflict and particularly by any allegations that may constitute statutes within the ju uh, crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, Mr. Khan. Mr. Khan. No, sorry, this lady first, then you. But your voice um, is very loud. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, two questions. First, um, how do you feel having been through this whole meeting about the issue of trying to get the, all of the disparate groups that are doing investigations together so that you're not duplicating efforts and uh, on trying to get some kind of uh, an arrangement for accountability rather than having 15 different efforts. And then I'll ask you my next, my second question. No, then I will give it to the other oh, lady. Okay. Yes, so a good try though. So in relation to the, uh, and we can come back if, if there's time. Uh, in relation to the, the, the first question, I mean, I've said uh, uh, in different fora, um, you know, more does not need, mean better. I think there's clear um, distinction between the International Court of Justice, which is a principal organ, of course, of the United Nations, uh, has a, a well-known and a vital role for state responsibility, uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, of course, the ICC, and then you know the Rome Statute is built upon complementarity. So it's the obligation, not just the right, the obligation, the responsibility of states to step up uh, and go forward. Now, in addition to that, into the mix, there's many other initiatives uh, that are there. Um, and I think coordination is vital. And what I've said in, in, in different fora that we have seen in terms of uh, humanitarian assistance and you know, uh, the need for OCHA, and I think in areas that are within the jurisdiction of the court, um, we should be willing to partner and work and also coordinate in a way that OCHA uh, endeavors to do for humanitarian assistance. I think we've had excellent uh, relationships so far with uh, the president, uh, Ladislav Hamran, of uh, Eurojust. We need to be non-territorial. It's not about building fiefdoms or uh, empires. It's about making sure that uh, every action is as effective as possible uh, because um, the world is watching, but also we have responsibilities in a very serious matter that we have to you know, um, move forward with. So I think that's uh, how we will work, uh, hopefully, ever more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, Margaret Bashir with Voice of America. Uh, you mentioned the collection and consideration of evidence. Could I ask you what role will technology play in your collection of evidence, and what sorts of things will you consider in terms of evidence, like from satellite photos to text messages to social media posts to this e-enemy chatbot? Uh, there's various things out there. What, what do you consider? To, to reach the international standard, I suppose, for well, evidence. Yeah, I'll do with the first part of that question first. Of my, I think it's a fabulous question. It's actually very close uh, to my heart, even before my election and throughout. I've been uh, repeatedly saying that to deal with the mass data sets that are one of the distinguishing characteristics of um, uh, uh, acts and indeed crimes that may come within the jurisdiction of the court, social media, uh, internet, photographs, um, video, uh, not just testimonial evidence, we need to harness technology ever better and uh, we did that quite effectively in my last mandate uh, as the special advisor and head of the UN team investigating ISIS. 
Um, we've had uh, some indications of support uh, for that, and we're going to uh, improve um, the c capacity of the court. And you know, it's about partnerships. Uh, technology is not a substitute to uh, old-fashioned methods, but proper effective investigations cannot take place without proper technology. You know, there needs to be a way to in ingest this uh, variety of material, testimonial, video, audio, uh, forensics. Um, there needs to be ways to um, uh, map out the different types of evidence, to look at the uh, um, metadata, which is uh, vital. I mean, you can imagine a witness uh, very often uh, traumatized uh, with the passage of time, their memories naturally uh, uh, will, may change, may falter, uh, and uh, judges, of course, must ultimately uh, assess uh, the credibility of a particular witness. The same applies to forensic evidence, but the advantage is if forensic evidence is collected properly, uh, the metadata um, can be um, scrubbed off uh, and collected in a way that doesn't alter. And then it's more capable uh, you know, to be uh, uh, viewed as reliable once it's been uh, tested and uh, it's been looked into. So it's absolutely um, you know, essential. There was an area I think I didn't answer. What was that part? Uh, this e-chatbot, e-enemy chatbot, do, would you include that in it, in it as well? I think all kinds of technology, and oh, I, I remember my point now, it's, it's not simply doing it with states. Um, I've said that every, you know, nobody can be a spectator, and I must really uh, single out and commend Microsoft and its president, uh, Brad Smith, because we uh, worked very closely with them in, uh, in UNITAD, my, my last mandate, and on my first tri uh, trip to Ukraine, when I came back, they were at the airport at Shkipol. I had further meetings, and they've also pledged to partner with us so that cognitive services, you know, the machine learning tools, the artificial intelligence, the face identification, uh, the, um, um, you know, translation tools that allow you to really identify what's, what should be looked at more closely, uh, all of that can be done far more effectively um, with technology, and then of course uh, the experts and the team can look into it, you know, dive into it more closely uh, and see what it shows. So I think this is, uh, you know, if, if any team does not embrace that fully, we're missing a massive opportunity, uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, we're, we're going to have that ready very soon. Chris Reyes with CBC News. Uh, with an investigation this thorough and this complex, is there any kind of timetable that you could give um, in terms of how this will play out? Well, we need to move quickly. I mean, quite frankly, uh, international criminal justice can't, I mean, I can't afford um, to be pedestrian. You know, in the Georgia situation, let me be quite, you know, uh, it, it was an investigation that commenced because of events in 2008. And um, there was a preliminary examination, there was an investigation. I did an evidence review uh, in, uh, November 2021. Uh, I applied for warrants in uh, March 2022. The judges will determine it. But we can't work in a way that by the time warrants are issued or that the prosecutor seeks a warrant, nobody remembers what happened originally. So I think the model also needs to change for international justice. I've said repeatedly this is an opportunity um, to redefine success. I said this before Ukraine. It's nothing specific to Ukraine. But, um, you know, we need to not view ourselves as a top of a pyramid, an apex, but really more of a hub in which we are a court of last resort. Uh, the judge is there to determine matters, but we can also feed in information, going back to technology, uh, to the spokes of national prosecutions. We can receive as well, collect as much information from states, but also our independent investigations, verify, look at the undercurrents, look whether evidence has been fabricated or altered. Uh, and then feed it to national authorities because every state has certain international law responsibilities and certainly every state has national legal responsibilities. So those that have uh, jurisdiction uh, need to uh, be supported. So I think really that's the, um, the model. And the other one is I think the court, uh, the, the previous model, I've inherited a number of cases. But I think um, you know, generally we need to try over a period. It won't happen straight away but we need to focus on maybe fewer cases over the next uh, period and go deeper instead of trying to do three or four cases uh, or five cases or six cases uh, from a situation, uh, go deeper 
because then you have a, a, an impact and also the knowledge you've uh, gathered, the skills that have been um, you know, um, brought into a particular situation, language and politics and undercurrents and culture or, or military organization, they can be more effectively deployed uh, by going uh, more deeply. Then hopefully we can see that this idea of international justice isn't uh, some kind of kumbaya principle. It's not about campfires and feeling good or trying to you know, uh, say a few words in the face of a gale that is silence, silencing our words before they get out of our mouths. We can show that international law can be effective, uh, effective and nimble and, and meaningful. And this is why I said earlier, it is one of these anchors that maybe we've disregarded. Before Ukraine, many countries have disregarded it. This is part of the contradictions and paradoxes of relationships. We have to stick with the law. Uh, this is one of the lessons, I think, as humanity and definitely as the United Nations, we need to heed. Stick to the law even when it causes discomfort, even when you feel you can get away with it or you can ignore it or close one's eyes to it. Because what we see is that if you don't hold yourselves to these principles, uh, others uh, with ever greater boldness um, tear up these principles. And I think this moment we see it coming together. Uh, the fact that uh, 42 uh, countries uh, have uh, uh, referred the matter to the court does not sh show to me the impotence of international law. It, it shows a vivid realization that we need the law more than ever. And now the challenge is not to talk about it, but to implement it. Anybody else? Okay, just one last question. I promised to. Um, you yourself have been to Ukraine, you've been to Bucha and some other places. Um, what was your reaction when you saw, for instance, the destruction and devastation in Bucha? And are you planning to go back to Ukraine again? Yes, God willing, of course. It's, uh, I think uh, I've said repeatedly one can't be effective as a lawyer or as an investigator. Um, without knowing the country and learning about it. One can't be a legal commander. Uh, you need to actually spend time in the country, and this is what we're trying to do with the team. I in terms of feelings, I, I won't uh, get into that, but I've been to many uh, parts of the world, in Asia, in uh, Northeast and West Africa, in Europe, in the Balkans, uh, in Rwanda, and of course in, in Ukraine and many other parts as well. And um, domestically, whenever one sees, whether it's domestic violence, uh, whether it's rape or whether it's uh, on a massive scale, uh, of course, uh, one has to be objective, whether you're a forensic officer, a crime scene officer, uh, you know, somebody in an ambulance or a, a fire, a, a member of the uh, fire service uh, or an international lawyer. Um, but at the same time, one needs to remain detached and be forensic about matters to always have a, a critical thought in one's mind because that's how you build strong cases, uh, not by uh, simply accepting anything at face value. You need to get to the bottom of everything. And when we do that, uh, I have every confidence that independent judges also will do the same. And uh, people should, uh, you know, the truth will emerge. And I think we will go faster uh, than before. And this is one of the opportunities to see how fast can we go as we're building additional capacity at the same time. Thank you so much.